I think 13 years ago I had about four caps for Connacht and I I was coming into um, contract negotiations and I was around this time of the year I was getting very worried that I was going to get kept on or if I was going to get let go. Um, so yeah, it was a very kind of, I suppose, uncertain time after giving up college and deciding to to chuck everything I had at playing for Connacht. So around this time, 13 years ago, it was a very worrying time for me. But yeah, thankfully they they kept me on and um, I managed to play quite a good few games the following year. Um, obviously Michael Bradley, Brad was our coach at the time. Eric was still playing, so um, yeah, Eric was still playing. So that was quite a while ago. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, there's a few lads on our team who were, I think, still in national school. So yeah, it's quite. Uh, Quite frustrating, really. 13 years and I'm still playing for Connacht, Jesus. When you're younger a little bit, you, you think these things go on forever and you think, oh, tomorrow and this and that. And I suppose we get very kind of um, bogged down and, oh, it's a nice day today and the weather's this and the weather's that. But when you get a little bit older, and I said um, recently in, a, in an interview that I, I sit beside old Masterson in the changing room um, he took over Swifty's spot and um, you see Owen, a, a young fella, in a lot of ways very similar to me, didn't come through the normal route of playing um, through schools and whatever else and you see the, the horrific injury he suffered last year so it kind of puts things into perspective that I'm lucky to be on a pitch and I've, I've been lucky um, to play for such a long time and um, yes you get injuries and that's part of it but in, in the grand scheme of things I've been very fortunate that I haven't got it too many injuries and um, I enjoy being out with the lads I enjoy um, going out training in no matter what type the weather is and clearly I've got it wrong today with my shorts on um, but I enjoy all aspects of it I, I enjoy getting up in the morning and running out and training with the lads and more importantly I, I enjoy the I don't know what would you call it the um, <laughs> I don't know what, what would you call the um, the very immatureness of the stuff that goes on off the pitch as well and the dressing room banter and everyone I speak to that's retired and that's the thing they miss the most and um, that's probably it's going to be a daunting reality when it, it does finally um, when it does finally come, come in and take over that I have to go back to the real world and that's probably the thing I'll miss the most but yeah it, it's, not, it's not hard for me to get up in the morning and go out training regardless of what way the weather is you do appreciate things and you do appreciate um, when you've been doing something for a long time and um, I suppose there's two ways of looking at it. You look at it in a sense that, um, geez, I've given a lot to Connacht and I, I've, I've been here and I've, done, I've done all this for such a long period but Connacht's given me a lot as well. It's given me the great opportunities to do and to, to meet brilliant people and to, um, I suppose, to be in an environment and to to live a lifestyle and um, that not a lot of people can and to to go and visit a lot of places that we're very fortunate to to um, to get to so yeah it's um, it's both ways um, and I'm very very fortunate in the position I've been in for the last few years and to go out um, and to represent where you're from and to pull on a jersey and to get paid at the end of the month is is, is a dream come true for me um, and. I'm very conscious that not everyone has afforded that dream and um, I'm, ver I'm one of the fortunate ones. So yeah, it's, um, it's something that uh, it's not lost on me. To think back to what was going through my mind and um, I suppose what, what was my thought process as, as a young fellow 19, 20 years of age making my first cap for Connacht or 20, 21 years of age. Um, I definitely had a lot more hair in my head and a lot less on my face. Um, I think I would have been thinking back about it now I would have been very naive um, I was probably if I was to talk to myself now and if I knew now what I if I knew then what I know now um, I would have probably said be brave and try and um, try and ha um, I suppose have higher expectations and try and um, push myself a little bit more and push um, the people around me a little bit more um, I suppose Sometimes when you're listening to a lot of people saying that, oh, Connacht are this and they're that and the team you're involved in are this and that, um, for a while I think I believe that. Um, and I, I suppose 
from my point of view and I look at where we've gotten to and how we've gotten here um, I would like to have got that journey quicker and I think in the first few years maybe um, I listened too much to people saying Connacht shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be there and you won't have a job next year and um, looking back on it um, there are things that at the time never really phased me too much but at the same time uh, I think every kid dreams to, to be big and dreams big and dreams about winning trophies and dreams about being successful and playing for the country and doing whatever else whatever your dream is I think for a while I probably believed in some of the, the stuff that was said off the pitch that oh you mightn't have a job next year you mightn't be able to do this next year and um, I, I'd probably say to myself dream big about Connacht and believe that you can achieve and get there and um, it took me a couple of years in my younger years to um, I was happy just to be there um, and to, to make the team and do whatever else and um, if I was to go back I'd probably change those things and um, expect more from myself and the people around me. There's a lot of times when and a lot of big games um, for various reasons obviously the Harlequins when we were we'd gone 13 or 14 games um, on a losing streak that was a big release and a big um, sense of satisfaction after I suppose being in such depths of um, depression or I don't know it's the nearest thing I've ever been to being depressed um, that was the hardest um, the hardest thing I've ever gone through um, just not getting results and questioning everything you're doing and questioning um, your own ability but then trying to come out the other side of it and knowing that you are doing the right thing you are working hard you are trying to do it but yeah it was a tough time and that to get that result was huge um, I think there's there's a couple of other big games in there as well and um, big big occasions um, Toulouse sorry uh, Toulouse at home um, one of our first uh, Heineken Cups uh, was it was a big game at home you, you're looking at the other provinces playing these big games uh, Toulon at home in a in a semi-final was a big game uh, there's a couple of Leinster games there uh, I think Mike McCarthy won't like me saying that but Swifty got an unbelievable try in a game Mike McCarthy got sent off in a game um, against Leinster which we won uh, beating Munster at home for the first time beating Munster away last year for the first time um, there's a lot of big games um, and a lot of games that maybe meant nothing to, to um, other people but meant a lot to me um, uh, a friend, a very good friend of my brother's, and um, uh, a lad I played rugby with, and who my brothers and a lot of my friends played rugby with, um, unfortunately passed away a, a few years back, and it was wasn't a great week. And I asked Eric to um, to play me at the weekend, even though I didn't do much training that week. And uh, I think we ended up uh, drawing a game against Glasgow. I think Niall O'Connor kicked a um, a penalty in the last play to draw the game, and. That game meant a lot for me um, on a personal point of view, but there's, there's lots of games, and obviously the final last year, the semi-final, Glasgow at home, there's, yeah, there's lots of them, and there's lots of bad days as well um, mixed in there. There was, there was a day in, in Dragons. Um, Dragons is a very unique place. It's a tough place to go to, small dress rooms, and um, I remember being in the dress room after a game and just saying, right, that's it, I'm going at the end of this season I'm leaving and um, that was hard to take to sit down after a game and say you're leaving the place where you love and um, you've given everything t to and for um, but yeah you get dragged in don't you you're involved in the game and you're you're involved in the day I suppose and you're emotionally involved in the day and you're trying to keep your emotions out of it and all morning we spoke about not letting the day get to us and um, not getting overawed by the day and then it was all going well went usual routine routine with the lads went for a coffee in the morning and chit chatted and the, the morning went quite quickly which was good um, nice early kick off so you didn't have to stay too long so that was all good then uh, we hopped in the bus and um, we had a guard escort or a police escort and um, I've had the the good fortune of being involved in an escort a couple of times and I've never been more frustrated in an escort in my whole life your man stopped for every red light, <laughs> was going about 20 miles an hour, and every Connacht car was passing us out who had drove to 
Edinburgh were passing us out while we were in a guard escort. So I was giving out to Tim, our manager, going, what's this full at? He hasn't a clue what he's doing. So I started getting a bit frustrated on the way in and there's probably a bit of tension and nerves, which usually I'm quite good at. But we got to the, got to the, um, the stadium and they, they have a habit in Edinburgh of stopping you at the gate and walking you in. Um, now bearing in mind when you're playing in Edinburgh against Edinburgh, there's about 4,000 people in a 65,000 capacity or whatever the, the stadium holds and you're getting ready for a game and whatever else and this fella's walking you in and it's about a four or 500 meter walk from the gate to, um, to where they finally let you down. So generally there's about 10 people in the stadium when you're arriving and when you're playing Edinburgh on a Friday night at around six o'clock but suddenly you're involved in a in a final and you see all these people and you see all these Leinster jerseys but you see this sigh of green coming and it's funny because throughout the sigh of green you can see Ulster jerseys and Glasgow jerseys and you're kind of I suppose during the week you're saying oh we're the underdogs you're, you're hoping everyone who's uh, neutral at the game is going to be shouting for you and you see all these Glasgow people who'd obviously bought their tickets hoping that they were going to have a home final and you see them all clapping you in and giving you fist pumps and all this and it's kind of surreal suddenly you realize Jesus this isn't the worst 400 meters to walk in when you're looking at all the people and you start figuring out um, faces in the crowd people you know and you go geez that person traveled and this person traveled and suddenly you're in Scotland there's bagpipes in front of you and we're getting this hero's welcome. I was kind of scratching my head going, Jesus, we've won nothing yet, and there's a long way to go, but um, we got to the, uh, where the bus have finally came to its stop, and I'd say majority of Connacht fans in their, um, in their wisdom had decided to line the edge of the, uh, of, I suppose, the, the walkway in, and it just happens that there's a stairway the whole way around, to get up to the top of the um, the top of the the stand, um, I think I got off about mid mid person or mid um, thing off the bus. At that point, I knew we were going to win, and I know that's easy to say that now, but I was thinking to myself, "Geez, we ain't going to lose this." It was absolutely hair raising to the highest. I never felt anything in my life like it. I. I don't think I lifted my head. I, I couldn't lift my head, to be honest. It was so emotional, and you're trying to keep, as I said, emotion out of it. But, geez, that was some feeling. I'd love to go back there. If, I think those kind of things happen only a handful of times in your life, and if you're lucky in, in your life. And that was certainly one of them. Um, after that, it was, it was easy. Um, there was about a minute to go, or two, I think, 30 seconds to go, or something on the clock. and. Um, I looked up at the clock and uh, you're in the heat of battle and I looked and I went, oh, 2010. And I looked, obviously scoreline 2010 and I looked at the clock and it was, whatever it was, 79 something or 78 something. And I looked at Sean O'Brien and the two of us had a hug. Um, little did I realize that Ali Muldowney and um, Andrew Brown were in front of me and they were just having, after having a little embrace themselves, kind of going, we've won this, we can't lose now. No matter what happens, there's not enough time for them to get two scores. And Ali turned around and told me to cop on. Um, there's still time to play. And I was like, sorry, sorry. But I didn't realise till afterwards that he was just after having his little embrace. But for the next minute, I was just running around, kind of not really realising what was happening. And then the final whistle came and yeah, it was phenomenal. Um, it it kind of... I don't know, this is going to sound stupid, but it kind of, everything slows down then after that for a few minutes and it obviously takes you, it takes you five minutes or so or whatever to go towards the trophy, but it just felt like it all, it was kind of a bit of a blur and until um, you finally get on the stand and you, you know that trophy's standing there. But um, look, I, I take great pride in the fact that I got to hold that trophy up. Um, I, I take great pride in the fact that I got to hold that trophy up for a lot of people. Um, not just the people who were fortunate enough like myself to be there on the pitch that day, but people who had played, people who've volunteered, who've coached, who've 
played for Connacht years and years before me and people who've, who've gave time um, and energy to everything that's gone on in Connacht rugby, upstairs, working there, voluntaries, it's it, like, I know it's, this is going to sound so corny, but it is a team effort and you don't get there on a day like that without everybody and I was very, very conscious of that all week, that um, a lot of people, um, there's a lot of moving parts to that and I was the very fortunate one at the very front of it. 13 years time, oh, I hope I'm standing in the clan. I've no doubt I'll still be supporting Connacht Rugby and I hope there's other people um, who in the position that I've been in for the last 14 or whatever years it is and that they're building their dreams and they're getting an opportunity. Um, the big thing is Connacht Rugby is here to stay um, and I suppose when I took over that was my worries of what, what will I have but the thing about Connacht is we've grown so much in the last couple of years we've got to start looking up and we've got to start looking at having more big days like we spoke about um, we've got to get trophies we've got to get more people playing for Ireland we've got to get more people playing rugby in um, in the province and all those things are growing and the more and more opportunities these kids get to, to grow and to play and pull on a Connacht jersey the better it's going to be for Irish rugby and the better it's going to be for Connacht and I'm just looking forward to being there standing watching them doing that and um, saying that I was fortunate enough to, to have worn that jersey and to have had that jersey for a while and ultimately that's what it is you get to hold on to it and pass it on to someone who's going to be bigger and better and that's the big thing I look forward to handing it over to someone who's going to be way better than me and I've absolutely no problem saying that and there'll be someone here in 13 years time or 10 years time going oh you, You've 300 and something caps, you're the most caps and whatever, and I can't wait for that. Um, I, I once dreamed of passing out Eric Elwood, and I managed to do that, and I hope there'll be a lot of lads who are born and bred in this province that'll hit 300 caps and hit 100 caps and 50 caps, and um, hopefully I'll be there to witness a good few of them.